Welcome to Roses All Trash, the sister podcast to read community, which is an international community where we read essential justice texts and critical theory. I'm Ryan. I'm Catherine. This episode accompanies the fourth week of March Narrative of Healing. As with all of our episodes, please do check the content warnings in the description of the episode. Thank you. Our first reading is by Resma Menekin. Um, It involves two chapters. The first one is The Wisdom of Clean Pain, which discusses the difference between clean versus dirty pain. Dirty pain perpetuates trauma and means that the person doesn't have to confront their own emotions and be responsible for their own healing, instead just sort of avoiding it in whatever way they can. And clean pain, though it hurts, involves addressing and confronting that trauma and finding a way to move forward out of it and thus breaking the cycle of trauma. And it discusses specific ways that this manifests itself, this dirty pain versus clean pain in white supremacy and racism and also in anti-racism work. and It discusses specific techniques to bring yourself out of this dirty pain cycle and into a clean pain cycle in terms of being able to like soothe yourself and to ground yourself to sensation and to stay present and feel but release that energy without harming others. The second chapter is whiteness without supremacy and it's talking about the white identity, specifically in America, but in the Western world, and the way whiteness has tied its own identity so deeply with supremacy that white people need to be able to build their own, a new culture for themselves and a new identity for themselves, which they have done historically through violence and through like the enslavement and colonization of others. And so this is discussing ways for white people to break the cycle and to really confront the racist work. And also the way white people from far right wing to like liberal progressive white people, how they have difficulty confronting their own racism and dealing with racism in the present moment. And instead give in to fragility and guilt and defensiveness and ways to break that cycle and do and focus instead on tangible work that makes a difference. Our last reading is by Padraig McAuliffe, Death and the Maiden as a Mirror Reflecting the Dilemmas of Transitional Justice Policy. So Death and the Maiden is a play set in and examining Chile's 1990s transition from dictatorship to democracy. The author was actually exiled during the dictatorship and had recently returned to Chile. But the, the plot of the play is about Paulina, who happens to recognize a random doctor as a doctor who raped her while she was imprisoned under the dictatorship. Paulina ties up the doctor at gunpoint, and she and her husband, who is a lawyer prosecuting the war crimes that had just happened, discuss how justice should look. Um, And McAuliffe discusses Death and the Maiden as bringing up questions like, is justice the same as revenge? Are there certain harms that are irreparable? What happens to the powerless when they achieve power? That's a quote. Um, These questions all surround the event of transitional justice, which we're actually probably more familiar with in the terms of like Hitler surrender and the Nuremberg trials, we can probably better picture the breadth of the legal and social and economic logistics um, in transitioning from administration to administration. But there's this debate that comes up in transitional human rights cases, which is the quote, truth versus justice predicament. When legal justice needs to happen, when whole countries need to recover and need to move on, this can only, this can often only happen through some level of cooperation between the new and old administrations. So obviously this is at the expense of an individualized sense of justice. Quote, Dorfman, the author of Death and the Maiden, seems to acknowledge the futility of justice for victims in the face of unspeakable brutality. Paulina rejects the sacrifice of justice and recognition in the interests of mediating political change. I wanted to start by talking about the concept of dirty and clean pain. I wanted to know if that concept is like familiar to you. Like, have you felt dirty pain? Have you felt clean pain? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the most obvious thing that like, this isn't about racism, so it's not really, but it's a good example of it is the idea of like self care in terms of clean versus dirty pain. And this is the first place where I heard it articulated in a way that I really understood like the difference is that like, what the dirty pain would be is self-care when it's like buying a new face mask or a ton of makeup or like sleeping all day, you know, which would be like doing things that 
feel good in the moment, but aren't necessarily what's best for you. Like if financially you can't afford to buy all that stuff or like, you know, you're neglecting your own like physical care or things like that. Whereas like, but like, that's what's marketed as self care, you know, like, because it's a way for corporations Mm -hmm. to sell things. Whereas like real self care can be things like doing your laundry or like doing the dishes and like, you know, getting your finances in order or things like that. And those things like don't feel good in the moment, but are actually caring for yourself in a way that's important. And that's, that's what the difference is. Yeah, I wanted to discuss this chapter along with the other chapter I chose as well, because I've needed language about this for a long time. Like I know sometimes when I'm having a difficult week, I'm just sort of treading water when I feel like there must be a better way. I feel like it's not even that it feels good to like be in bed all day or whatever. Like it's just, I can't imagine myself doing anything else. And so you're kind of drawing on this like surficial strength or like a strength of habit as opposed to thinking like, where can I find the strength right now to do the right thing for myself, you know? Like not saying that depression days or laziness is a habit, but rather realizing when you're in a stuck position and your reflex being, I can find my way out of this. Like it takes time and practice to learn that you're resilient as well as time and practice to sort of build up your the actual resiliency. Yeah, and to learn the skills that make it most effective because that's, I think, also something is like there's this gap between like what we know is the right decision to do versus like enacting that decision that's really hard for people I mean I keep coming back to finances for myself because for me like that's a big one is like when I get stressed about money I'm like I just like don't even want to think about it I just want to like buy things that make me feel happy and like not think about it but like taking the time to like look down like at my student loans and at my bank account and budget out like it took me a long time to understand what step to take because it just felt so overwhelming I was like there's nothing I can do it's finding the steps. And that's something that I think Resma, like that's what they're, he's discussing is the steps. Cause like the concept, I feel like most people can like agree with and understand, but it's really hard to enact it in the moment because dirty pain is the easy cycle to continue. And so the Mm -hmm. steps of, of like soothing yourself and grounding yourself in the like sensations and emotions in your body, instead of reacting to them and like accepting the discomfort and staying present and then being able to like release those emotions. Those are like, people don't have the tools to start up those steps. Right. So what you just were talking about is the five anchors that Resma includes in this chapter. And, you know, he obviously is saying that like, you can't control when you run into the pain or not. You can't control if you get hurt or not. It's just about like putting it through the right channel. If you're like swallowing something, you want it to go down your eating tube, not your breathing tube, if that makes sense. One of my biggest insecurities is that I'm never doing anything real. I know I've mentioned that before on here. I feel like I'm never doing anything actual or I, like, I don't know. There's no other word for it. I just feel like I'm never doing anything real. Like I'm just sort of in stasis or everything I'm doing doesn't count or doesn't matter or something. Like, that doesn't go away. The source of that pain doesn't go away if I take a day to just lie in my bed and, like, not think about it, right? The source of it comes from reconnecting with my sense of purpose, understand, like, correcting some of my thinking about myself, and also going and doing things that I'm proud of. I think I take that fatigue and I'm like, let me just address this fatigue instead of where is that source of pain coming from? How can I, like, address the actual problem. The problem isn't necessarily that I'm actually not doing anything. The problem may be that I need to correct my thinking. One of the anchors that really resonated with me was the third one, which is accepting the discomfort instead of trying to flee. Because something that he notes is when you get the impulse to analyze or think about the discomfort, bring yourself back to just the sensation of the discomfort itself. And that's the one that like was important for me because I'm someone like when I'm facing a discomfort, or like a struggle. I mean, what comes to mind for me is like relationship issues or like a situation in my relationship where like I'm really stressed and really anxious. My gut reflex is to analyze it and figure out the answer 
like my mind is sort of hardwired to be like, there is a right answer. And if I just think about it hard enough, like I'll find the answer and then I just have to do the answer and it'll be okay. You know, cause like I'm trying to soothe myself by telling myself there's a right answer when there's not like, you just have to accept the fact that it's uncomfortable and honestly painful. And that's just what the situation is. And like, let it sit with it instead of trying to analyze the issue and fix it. Yeah, that's like one of the biggest things I sort of realized I had to work on just in general in like sitting through pain and like letting it go through me, you know, Um, I didn't even realize like how much I was running from pain and like, because I never thought of myself as a hedonistic or really indulgent person, like financially or like with food or with clothes or makeup or anything like I'm not I'm not really... I've never really been somebody who like takes comfort in material things. So I didn't realize that like just needing my brain to be occupied at all times was still a form of running from pain. Like needing to be reading something or to be watching something at all times. Like sure, you know, it's not going to wreck me as much as like someone who is racking up credit card debt, but it's still if we if we were in a vacuum, like I would be at the same level of healthiness as that person. And so, yeah, I would like we're kind of like we're kind of synced up today because I was going to ask you which of the five anchors is like has been present in your life. Yeah, I agree. Sitting with the pain is a really like key one that unlocked a lot of things for me. Yeah, that's like, okay, not to harp on like my past relationships, but that's something that like I had to learn how to do. And like, I'm still obviously not perfect at it, but like. I mean, through my most recent breakup, like, I've definitely learned a lot about, like, just letting myself feel the way that I feel in the moment. If I have to go cry in the bathroom 12 times in one day, like, it's fine. Like, just, like, let yourself cry until eventually you're done. It'll pass eventually like it does, which is so, so cheesy and cliche. But it's just something that, like, letting myself just experience how I was feeling and, like, telling myself it was okay to feel that way and, like, just indulging myself in like you know those emotions is what allowed it to pass instead of trying to be like we're gonna fix this emotion I think a lot of people will relate to this but a reason why I sort of avoided so much pain is or a way that I did it uh, maybe both was that I felt like I was too good for it which is very weird to to think of but like I felt like I was too good to suffer as in if I lived well enough or if I did enough right things or good things or successful things then there would be no reason for me to feel pain does that make sense a little yeah like if I managed my studies right if I managed my career right if I managed my friends and my relationships right then why would I ever have a a need to feel pain you know yeah it's like a way of preemptively trying to prevent it yeah a very waspy approach yeah right (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like don't go to therapy, just get drunk like everyone, like, like the, the rest, rest of us, us or whatever. Yeah. Like very, very waspy. Just become a functioning yeah. alcoholic. Yeah, just, just do it. it. <laughs> just do, do it. it. It's kind of terrifying um, how normalized alcohol is in our culture. That's a I agree. That's I agree. like, I was talking to one of my coworkers and he was like, yeah, like I drink like a drink or two or three by myself, like most nights. And I'm like, Dude, like what? No. <laughs> So do I, and so do a lot of my friends. It's, like, the only thing that, like, breaks up the day during COVID, but also I can see myself doing it, like, in the future as well. If I get a job that, like, takes up most of my free time and stuff, like, what am I going to do to break up the day, you know? I I kind of do that with coffee, but that's the opposite. That's the start of my day, you know? Mm. I don't know. It's still it's still an addictive drug. It's just a stimulant, not a depressant. So I can't take any moral high ground for that. No, I know. I feel like that's a way for me to run as well. Because I've expressed it like, I'm so tired of being in my own head. Like, I need to be somebody else for the last, like, couple hours of the day before I go to bed, you know? Like, that's exactly what it is. Like, I'm so tired of, like, thinking, engaging. I don't have any solutions there. Yeah, journaling helps me. That's like, that's like plugging in even harder. I can't do that. <laughs> I need to be more out of touch. I used to do, I, I've done this sometimes recently, but I used to do this all the time as if I was feeling like particularly angry or upset. I would like, I'd have a two page like spread in my journal and I would just 
fill it with writing like to the edge just every word like all the things I was feeling even like the things that like if I was angry at someone I write like literally the meanest things ever like just like let all my rage out or whatever and then I would sew the pages shut because I was like okay like we let it all out and like it's there and then like okay we need to like move on you know yeah because I'm also a person who dwells so that kind of I mean it also involves like the two mediums that like are really big in your life right the writing and the sewing like it's very physical and I think actually that would probably be a ritual that like Resma would approve of the writing it by hand I think is really important I mean like typing it out or something is does it's not the same like writing it down by hand and having it as a physical piece of paper in your hand is like very different and I Mm -hmm. think it's an important aspect of it I don't know that to me feels like you're running to to your pain which is good that is clean pain one thing I found funny in both the chapters that we chose are kind of funny like they're very (laughs) they use very accessible language um but in the first anchor where you have to soothe yourself quiet your mind calm your heart and settle your body that's all in the first anchor one of the ways that he provided like to practice that or to do that is to go to the bathroom and just be like, hey, I need to use the bathroom. I'll be right back. Because in most situations, if you say like, I need to be alone or like, I need a second, then they might go after you. Whereas if you're like, I'm gonna just going to go to the bathroom, like it gives you a space. It gives you a second in which someone's not going to follow you in. I thought that was really helpful. <laughs> That was helpful, but, like, kind of funny, because I'm also imagining two people, like, in a screaming match about politics, and one of them being, like, I gotta pee. <laughs> yeah. Well, something else he mentioned, too, like, if that's not an option, like, take off your sweater. Like, literally just give yourself a second to, like, do something else. And, like, be in the dark of your sweater for, like, half a second, and then, like, come out and be, like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think the like shock value of like breaking up a big argument with I have to pee, I think also. (laughs) It would, yeah. No, I agree. Right, like don't, uh, even the fifth anchor, which I wanted to ask you about. The fifth anchor is to release your energy afterward. And And he says like, it's very natural for like adrenaline to build up, rage to build up and stuff. Um, I learned when I was training for my job at the crisis nursery that when someone is angry with you, they hear 7% of what you're saying. Like 7% of it registers. Isn't that crazy? Like you say a hundred words to them and they only really take in seven of it. So there's really zero point to talking when you're very impassioned. And it completely makes sense. Like the adrenaline builds up, you need to let it out. And he says like, you should engage in something afterward that lets you disperse that energy. Like it's perfectly normal to have all that emotion in a stressful situation. You just gotta like, remember, it's not for you to throw on this other person. Like there's a way to safely dispose of batteries. There's a way to safely dispose of your anger, you know? I like to take a lot of walks and I like that I pace a lot too. And I feel like that that's part of it, like when I'm stressed. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I don't have anything like that. Like my when I was growing up, there was a lot of like arguing in my household and a lot of like yelling and stuff. So I never really, I don't know. I never had like a physical outlet for that. But I have to think of something. When it comes to like arguments or like something I'm really upset about, like if a friend or like a partner like says or does something that like really hurts my feelings, like my personal policy is like I usually let it sit for like at least a day or two, if not like three days. This is kind of a combination of two things where like, one of my family friends taught me that like whenever I'm super angry or upset about something like a good way to like kind of check myself is to like take a deep breath and be like am I hungry am I thirsty am I tired like what like check in with all of my physical symptoms first and like oftentimes you find that like oh I'm just like really tired and like so irritable right now things like Mm -hmm. that and like once I go through that and like if I'm still upset about it like letting it sit for a day or two because that gives me the time to cool off and oftentimes I'll realize like oh it wasn't a big deal I was just like having a bad moment or it gives me the time to articulate exactly what it was that made me angry because that's really hard to do off the cuff like someone says something and it makes you angry but you're just like I hate that but you don't know why yet and then like taking the time to step back be like oh that made me feel like you were being condescending to me because I make less money than you Like, having that time to be able to articulate it makes a big difference when it comes to actually resolving the conflict. 
for me, every time I get angry, just because, again, I grew up with a lot of, like, people being angry at me and, like, yelling at me and stuff and me not being able to respond or feel comfortable saying exactly, like, what I wanted to respond. Every time I get angry now, it feels like an opportunity almost. Like, for whatever reason, I want to, like, take it and run with it because I'm allowed to be mad now as an adult. And I have to remind myself, like, actually, no, it might feel good to expend all that energy right now, but you won't be so sure after. Like, almost every time that I'm angry about something and I express it right in that moment, either I don't think about it after or when I do think about it, I regret exactly how I put it. Because I I realized, like, I would, I actually would have done that differently if I weren't mad. Like, as simple as that sounds, like, I actually would have done something differently if I were not mad at that moment. So it's like, look at your pictures from, like, when you got drunk the night before. Like, I would not have done that. <laughs> and so, yeah, when you're angry, like, like it's not you, you know? Yeah. And that's so. something I've also found is that, like, whenever I've reacted in anger in the moment, I often regret it. But also, like, whenever I assume the worst out of people, it often, like, isn't true in a situation where someone has like said something that upset me or like did something that I'm angry about oftentimes I try and like give them the benefit of the doubt as much as I can because like there's usually some other shit going on that I did not know about and then like when eventually like they like tell me about it or like I figure out what's up then I'm like oh, okay like thank god I didn't like call them a bitch because I realized <laughs> they were like going through all this shit worst case scenario if I like choose to like be the bigger person whatever that means in that situation and like be more forgiving Worst case scenario is, like, I forgave someone who didn't deserve it, which, like, isn't really a reflection on me. It's a reflection on them. Well, okay. Yeah. This is, like, Resma's anchors. This is all talking about conversations about racism, even though we took it off into a different direction. And I think these points are all really important. And I feel like, for me, like, as a white person, when I try and have discussions with other white people about racism sometimes they get really defensive because of course no one wants to hear like oh hey that thing you said or did was racist you know or like no one people don't like to have these arguments they like their echo chambers and I think obviously this is a job for like me as a white person to do not for like people of color to be forced to take on but something I've found these techniques to be effective when it comes to having these conversations not interrupting them like letting them speak and kind of get their energy out and then asking questions to kind of forcing them to self-reflect to be like why like what do you mean when you say that and like why do you think that's true getting more to the root cause of the problem and then asking them to personalize it because you can kind of break apart sort of the loose casual racism with their own insecurities or like their own fears uh, or like the dirty pain that they're reacting out of and help them kind of like take a step back like making it more of a like a personal one-on-one conversation and also like when I offer a rebuttal talking about like, oh, my friend's experience was this or like my experience is this. That makes it less about like, I have these statistics and you have those statistics and it's just a fight. It becomes more of an engagement. And that's, I mean, I can't say that I've like changed anyone's lives or anything, but like the, the, those are the only times I've actually become semi-productive or like semi-productive at changing someone's opinion a little bit. Mm, someone who's defensive, right? They're... I mean, they're they're defensive. Like the person that they're most poised to to protect right now is themselves and their sort of correctness or their sanctity. Um, during the Black Lives Matter protest this summer, one of my friends posted on her Finsta that her parents. So my friend is Chinese and her parents are both Chinese. She was like, "How do I tell them that?" It matters. Like, how do I tell them that, like, the looting is justified and whatnot? And one of the, you know, people were giving her really helpful tips about getting through to them. But I didn't want her to forget that it's not a case of, like, they're too, they're from another generation or they're too stupid or they don't get it or the language barrier or whatever. Like, they're adults. They have fully functioning brains. They've been living, been having political opinions. No matter how apolitical they feel they are, they have had double, triple the years that you have had, and they decided to have this opinion. Remember that you're not going to get through to them by talking to them as a child, but like ask them like, well, why do you think that? And like, what, how did you get there? Also, when people are defensive, they want to be understood 
or heard or whatever or feel heard and if you can do that yeah it's also like it's a balance like with super with I mean also I'm I'm speaking from my experience of like some of my extended family like living in rural Idaho much more right wing and like when they get worked up about that like even if I'm trying to be like oh like why do you think that and like trying to get them to dig deeper it's like it's always a balance of like okay like is this an opportunity where I can actually get them to like do some self-reflection or like is this are they just going to take this as a time for a 40 minute tangent you know there's a quote from Resma's reading white allies must build culture because culture trumps almost everything else I wanted to know your reaction to that I thought that was that was like honestly a profound profound insight because all of white culture and identity has been around superiority I'm thinking of We talked about this, like, one-on-one ourselves, but Dr. Sabrina Strings, her book, Fearing the Black Body, and, like, white feminine identity has been built around being thin, specifically because they associate thinness with whiteness and fatness with blackness. And this whole identity and culture and, like, the diet industry and, like, all of our fashion, like, our fashion models and all these things are built on this construct of thinness being an emblem of moral superiority and like of racial superiority mm-hmm. as like a tool to allow for colonization and white supremacy. We really do need to build a new culture and like decon- like deconstruct this yeah, whole like, was- you know, immense apparatus that we've created. Mm-hmm. I was reading this book called Race and Racism in America and it was like really trying to get at like the historical origin of race. Um, and basically it was kind of built on this thesis that racism and like race classification is a worldview that before let's say the 1400s there were there was an awareness of race but they primarily used other things to divide people up and divide groups up and so as the slave trade became bigger and as the English started participating in the slave trade the way that they interacted with African people were different than how the Spanish and this Portuguese interacted with African people because they had been, one, in contact with them for longer, and two, they had history of being conquered by African people. And so they had this like relative familiarity with them and also a history in which the Spanish and Portuguese superiority was an absolute. Whereas the English, because they're so far north geographically, they had not really interacted with Africans before they participated in the slave trade which had existed before the english got into it and so this this author also said that you know theories about slavery being the reason for black what is it like black suppression or like black inferiority the idea of black inferiority that theory has also been disproven because the english going in had this idea that like they were human and then other people of other races were not human because they felt like they were so different from them and they were like it it just can't be like they just and that's how it like bled into this like dar- social darwinism and everything it's just like like the separation it within race classification became so built in such a worldview that everything that came like every new piece of information had to make sense within that worldview i was not african-american or the Museum of African American History in DC, there was a they were discussing about like how race as a construct sort of started in the US. And they talked about like there are these like, you know, there's a slave rebellion and there were these like white indentured servants who were essentially were like, you know, at the same level as slaves in terms of the social and economic hierarchy. And they were originally like working with this enslaved people to try and um revolt and to gain ground and to like, you know, fight for their rights and it was a conscious decision that was made to abandon the enslaved people to ally themselves with the white identity rather than their like working class identity because that was more opportunistic for them to do and they were talking about like this like choice that was made and how that was like really instrumental in the way race was constructed in America and I think that goes back to what you said earlier with like we talk about people like, oh, they're just a different generation. Or, like, they just don't understand. But, like, they do. They're adults who are just as intelligent as we are, who, like, mm-hmm. take in the world and form critical thoughts and opinions about them. 
and they make decisions, sometimes unconscious, but sometimes conscious. And those decisions really shape our world. Yeah, Race and Racism mentions that as well. They were talking about how Africans, and, and I feel like so many individual pieces of this history of race and the slave trade in America are, are taken and they're like, oh, this is why white people aren't bad though. This is why they had no choice or whatever. But all together they create this really cohesive story about how, yes, Africans were participating in selling Africans the same way that English feudalism was based around like people owning people basically or people owning everything that belonged to somebody. Africans were the preferred resource, became the preferred resource because the other alternatives were enslaving native people, which that narrative actually made more sense to a lot more English people because they were taking over their land, right? But there weren't enough indigenous people to make a substantial workforce. And then the other option was shipping in Irish people. And I don't remember why, but like for whatever reason, that wasn't ideal either. Africans as slaves became preferred. And then, so you're right, slaves and indentured, black slaves and indentured, white indentured servants were kind of on the same socioeconomic level until about the 1660s in which the plantation economy of the U.S. started to really take shape and they needed all that labor. And they, again, made the choice, like, would we rather keep all of, like keep importing white indentured servants or would we rather keep importing African slaves? And that's when the, legislat the legislature, a hundred years already after the first people landed or the first English people landed in the US, they started putting in these laws about like how you had to be a slave until you died and then your children also belong to the same master. Like these laws came a hundred years after because they wanted, they chose to build the American economy through that resource. That's like yeah. the, the old argument where people are like, oh, like, well, the, like this sounds like they couldn't help it. They had to keep slaves because they're like, their economy was depending on it. Like, what would they do without it? Like, well, their economy would suck, but like people wouldn't <laughs> be enslaved. So <laughs> when people give me that argument, I'm like, okay, so you value money more than human lives. Like, that's literally what you're telling me. Like, that's just like the crux of your argument. Yeah, or like you admit it, the U.S. should have failed. Like, <laughs> you admit it, Black people were essential to the success of the United States and the, and the U.S. becoming the greatest country in America. You admit it, we needed to enslave people to do that. Um, and that's the thing, right? Like, then people take that and run off with it and become these, like, white, white communists, basically, are like, actually, race doesn't matter, class matters. No, 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 no. <laughs> like... Not super related. I was gonna talk about a scene from Gone with the Wind because now it's in my head. But there's a scene in it where okay, Scarlet, the main character, is a woman, and there's Ashley, who is like her family friend, who she's been in love with because he's married to another woman. Anyhow, uh, she is running this mill in Atlanta, I think, this like general store and like lumber mill, and it's after the war, so slavery's been abolished. She's running it with Ashley, who's a guy whose his name is just Ashley. And so she and Ashley are running this mill and she hires local prison labor like for next to nothing. And the overseer is like, how much like you need them to get done? Like, you know, and Ashley's like, well, treat them humanely. And she's like, I don't care what you do. Just get it done. Like, you know, I'm closing the door. What do you do these prisoners? It's none of my business. And Ashley is talking to Scarlett. These were both plantation owners for the record before the war. Mm -hmm. And Ashley is like, I can't stand for this. Like, I can't. <laughs> he literally says can't stand to make money off of the forced labor of these men <laughs> and, and scarlet says ashley you own slaves like she calls him out on it and she's like well that was different we treated them humanely and i feel like that scene like really captured something about the white experience in america because i feel like <laughs> most people fall into one of those two categories wow no, no no i was i agree i completely agree i just was sh shocked at your like <laughs> it sounded like a headline like it sounded like a like a medium article or like a now this like <laughs> i don't know that's like gone with the wind is like super controversial for good reason and i don't presume to make any statement on whether it's like should exist or whatever i felt like it captured something about like girl boss feminism too like, mm -hmm. that's what I thought. I was like, that's a hashtag girl boss. <laughs> Scarlet's a girl boss. <laughs> I, I really liked Resma's example of, because, okay, 
first thing that Rasmus says is, right, like, white people need to rebuild a culture that's not based on supremacy. And then he was like, and also, don't ask me what it is, because I don't know, and I will not tell you. Because he was like, that's so weird. Like, why would you ask a black person to create whiteness for you that, like, continues to center white fragility and, like, white passiveness in race relations in the U.S.? And then he was like, but here are some examples. And he mentioned a lot of he mentioned like 12 step programs like Al-Anon and he mentioned like he talked about how they have fully created this structure that so many hundreds of thousands of families are involved in they accept these like sort of principles as truth they hold on to them they celebrate them they they have a system of celebrating people who like make their way through 12 step programs it meant a lot to me because I listened to a podcast on which one of the hosts, her father, was like a drug and alcohol addict growing up, when she was growing up. She's been, she has gone to meetings where like relatives of addicts can go and talk to each other. She's also been reading the big book, which is like, like all the 12 steps and like what explaining them and stuff. That to me is like an amazing example of like cultural wisdom. Like I feel like Because, like, a lot of entertainment and a lot of, like, actual arts and literature that are considered part of white culture, because of, like, this hegemony hegemony of white culture, we all sort of are opted into it. And so it's hard to isolate exactly what arose out of white people doing white people things in their white people communities without it being about supremacy, you know? I really appreciated that example that he gave. Yeah, that's like, I mean, when people talk about like building a new culture for like white people or for the US and like, you know, the difficulty of it, like, yeah, of course, that's something that's not going to happen overnight. And it's going to, like, it's going to need to start in an individual scale. But like, I think for myself, like, my relationship with food as someone who deals with anorexia and has for a long time, like, okay, it's not like I've cured my mental illness, but the way I approach food and the way I approach bodies is very different. Not because of the anorexia even but because I've like dealt with it long enough that I've learned to like I've been doing my best to rewire my brain and to like like, recontextualize things like when I look at people's bodies or when I look at like weight loss videos or when I look at like nutrition labels or things like that or like when I hear people talk about like you know how much they weigh or how much I weigh or like how much they you know like I've worked so hard to build a new set of references for those experiences so when I, like, yeah. face them, I, like, don't revert back into, like, the the original set of references I was given. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, if I can do that, like, we can absolutely, like, recontextualize our experience of white identity, like, and, right. like, create a new set of references for us. Like, obviously, yeah. it's long, hard work. I'm not as far as I'd like to be on my own work with that. But, like, starting on an individual level. Yeah, and culture isn't just real time it's primarily inherited and like culture is something that people look back on in order to understand who they are and so Resma talks about passing it on to your kids like passing on the context of race relations and a new type of whiteness to your kids say the part about know. naming naming your children after, <laughs> after prominent black figures I'm like I don't know if I would be doing that like yeah. as much as I <laughs> But Claudette Colvin, right, is the name of the girl who was, the f- like, before Rosa Parks, the first one who refused to give up her seat, but then they, like, redid it because she was a pregnant teenager or something. Oh. Yeah, anyhow. Yeah. Like, I would teach my child, but, you know, Cla- Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks, but I don't think I would name my child Rosa Parks because that feels a little <laughs> like. Yeah, that seems a little weird. But he did also say, like, or you could name them after white people who fought racism. Yeah. That makes <laughs> no, I know. There's other people. Not just Abraham Lincoln was our last white activist. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you think Abraham no Lincoln's a white activist? We have <laughs> the last time a white person did anything anti-racist was in 1880. <laughs> so that kind of made me realize, like. I have really, partly because like my family was a huge source of like pain in my life growing up, I have really strong ideas about how I would want to raise my kids, sort of like the way, you know, you look at nutrition labels differently, you look at food differently. So your the way you treat food in your household is probably going to be very different 
from like the default way, you know? And so I have a lot of ideas about like, this is how I think I should be reinforcing my kids. This is how I think a parent's relationship to their kids should be. Me having those specific ideas made me feel like, oh, I'm gonna be kind of the one calling the shots in my household or in like with my spouse. And that made me uncomfortable because I didn't really know how to advocate for exactly what I wanted without also shutting them down. But Resma being like, you need to pass on a certain type of culture to your kids made me realize kind of, we're all born into shit and we're all swimming in shit our whole lives. Like once you start to swim out of it is when you realize just how bad it is. So like, how can you allow anyone remain in that you know like that's why that's why it matters so much to me not because I'm like stubborn or not because I'm like domineering or something like that although I arguably am both of those things it just it matters because I can see that it's so bad and someone who's still swimming in that shit someone who hasn't done the work that I've done or been through that kind of like processing that I have can't possibly know how like disgusting their like what we're born into is like finally kind of going on to the second reading um first of all did you have any like reactions to it like hearing about it the difference between revenge and justice is what really struck me i did like it because i think that's really like a very shifting fine line and i think that goes back to our previous episodes about restorative justice and obviously that's something that can only be defined on a case-to-case person-to-person basis but like how do we find a way to systematically restore justice when it's so individualized like it seems futile you know it's It's definitely definitely something something that that we can can talk talk about in terms of transitioning out of slavery um and like the the debate debate on reparations being made also Also, with with, like like, when japanese americans were interned in during world war ii like they got reparations although obviously these checks were like almost they're almost insulting to be found like two years years later later, and then they're they're like we have a check from the government for you because because we are sorry that we like imprisoned you for violating your human rights exactly destroyed your Um, that there's a lot i think there's a lot of transitional justice moments in u.s history one of them is in going from trump to biden so it's called the truth versus justice predicament right where there are all of these logistics to enacting justice or to making reparations and none of it feels personal enough none of it feels right enough none of it like really makes it better and I was wondering if you can see a kind of truth versus justice predicament in going Trump to Biden I mean yeah I can but I think also that would imply that the Biden department was act like actively working to restore justice right now which I don't think that they are well they've done a lot I think we're already forgetting how the world literally felt like it was ending when Trump was elected like Like, we we were were like like, how can this happen you know that's true But, okay, what I mean is, like, people talk about, like, the difficulties of it and, like, how hard it is and, like, how, like, the logistics and the bureaucracy and all that. I don't know. I'm kind of, like, like, our senators get paid $85 an hour or something like that, right? So, like, do your job. Like, that's, like, I'm literally paying you to deal with this because it's incredibly difficult. Like, that's why you're getting paid an absurd amount of money. So, like, that's, like, when people are like, oh, but, like, it's so hard. I'm like, well, that's why we hired them to do this job because it's Mm -hmm. hard, you know, like... And in terms of the impersonality well, yeah. of it, like, the truth aspect of it, like, of course, it's never going to be enough. Like, nothing will ever be enough. It's better than nothing. But I don't mean that in a way to be like, oh, like, you know, this is as good as it gets. Like, you should be satisfied with this small thing to the people who, like, have dealt with this oppression and who deserve reparations and who deserve justice. What I mean is, like, it's better than nothing. Constantly doing everything we can to make these reparations even though it's always going to be impersonal and it's never going to be enough, is like, it's better than nothing. Yeah, that's why Death of the Maiden, to clarify, we're reading an analysis of the play, not the play itself, but the play itself is so, it's so, what's the word? Astute? It's so astute because there's this perspective of the woman who was literally imprisoned and like assaulted. And then there's the guy who did that and she like realizes that it's him because of his voice and his mannerisms. And then her husband is a lawyer prosecuting people like that doctor because like he's, he was one of the good guys. And I think like, you know, the author of the play could have made it so that he was upset with his wife because he, he could have been one of those like 
um, white liberals, if that makes sense, who's like, no, 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 don't go too far. But he's not. In the play, he realizes how unfair it is. He just doesn't see another way. Like, he just feels like prosecuting is the only viable way, even though he, he sees that it's not enough, you know? I mean, this, it feels like what you, you said earlier about, like, it's such shit and you can't see it till you get out of it. And also about, like, personal responsibility and, like, just the individual steps that you can take. Not that you shouldn't, not that you should, like, stop trying to work on this systematic level or, like, this greater scale. But, like, once you start to realize, like, how shit it all is and how it's, like, never, ever truly going to be good, like, you got to do what you can and what you can do is work on an individual like person to person level and like in your immediate community to do what you can do to make it better like you or you can never make it better i right? speaking from the perspective of like a white person like it's never going to be better it's never going to be good enough but like it's not, <laughs> you're just going to make it worse if you give up so <laughs> yeah yeah i think that's why death and the maiden is so well written because no one wants to identify with any of the three perspectives and no one does like by making the lawyer husband understand what paulina is going through and understand that it's like what he's doing is not enough i i, I don't know i feel like that like one decision really made the play so like so accurate This has been Roses All Trash, the accompanying podcast to Read Community. This is the episode for the fourth week of March. I'm Catherine. I'm Ryan. Please follow us on our, wherever you get podcasts, be that like Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We're also on YouTube, um, as well as our personal Instagram accounts, Catherine.Shark and (laughs) R-R-R-Y-E-N. Yeah, thank Um, you so much and we'll see you next week. Bye!